coming up next on Arizona Horizon. Maricopa County supervisors vote on a new budget. Test scores show that eighth graders are not improving in three key areas of education. And it's Asian Pacific American History Month. We'll talk about one of the state's fastest growing populations. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The Maricopa County Board of Supervisors approved a new $2.2 billion budget yesterday, which much, with much of the money going to public safety and criminal justice. Joining us now is Maricopa County Board of Supervisor Chair Steve Chukri. Good to see you again. Good to see you. It's nice to be here. Uh, $2.2 billion. Is this thing balanced? <laughs> it is. It is balanced. And, and as you know, uh, this new Board of, of uh, Supervisors who's come in to to the county, uh, I guess we've, most of us have been there now about two and a half years, have been more business focused. You know, how do we bring this business mindset to government? And uh, the product you see before you, the tenant of budget we passed yesterday, I think is a good work product uh, for, with a business perspective to it. We mentioned balanced. Uh, well, it's one thing to be balanced, it's another to be structurally balanced. Is this structurally right. balanced? You know, it is structurally balanced. And, and Ted, I could tell you that, you know, reading a P&L in a business and reading a P&L in government are two different things. And so what we, what we mean by, by structurally balanced in this case is that we're providing a budget that that works we're providing a budget that not that isn't necessarily drawing down on surpluses to meet the obligation we're actually working with the dollars we have uh, and appropriating those dollars to make sure we're balancing uh, speaking of the dollars you have 32 million dollars in state budget impacts everything from cost shifts to mandatory what, what's this all about and how far does this go in your dealings with the state well if you look back to 2008 going forward really that number is is really approaching about 280 some million now as some of my colleagues would admit i, I think that it's tough it's tough to to take on those those burdens from the state uh, but at the end of the day, we all have to realize the county, not only Maricopa County, but all 15 counties in Arizona, we are an arm of the state. And with that, that means we have certain responsibilities, certain mandates to, to follow. And so I look at it more as we're putting our shoulder to the wheel with the legislature. We're taking on this burden and we're going to work through it. But what we also want to do and work with our legislators is to say, look, this cannot be in perpetuity. This cannot be ongoing because all you're doing is shifting the cost here to the other hand and you're going to force eventually in increases in taxes. But how do you make that argument when it seems like it increases, it goes on and on? And critics again look at this budget and they see 269 since the recession uh, absorbed by the county. They're saying that the state right. is basically balancing its budget on your back. Well, in, in many ways you can, you can make that argument. But I, again, I don't think we can lose sight, and I, and I appreciate your, your thought process here, but I don't think we can lose sight that we are an arm of the state. Uh, and with that, we have a fundamental responsibility to work with our, our Speaker of the House, our legislators, and the President of the Senate. However, I will tell you, I don't believe that we can continue to do this in perpetuity. Some of these cost shifts, Ted, must go back to the state uh, or else you're do we're doing exactly what's, what you're saying. And that is, I should say the legislature is doing exactly what you're saying. And that is shifting these costs and, and we're, we're going to have to tackle them each and every year. And at some point, we're going to have to cry uncle because we won't be able to fulfill it. Another concern, uh, drops in revenues, property taxes, sales taxes. How much of an impact was that on the discussion for this budget? Well, we're, we're fortunately starting to see an increase now as the economy starts to heal, although it's, it's very tepid, it's, it's very, we're inching our way out of this, we're not growing our way out. Uh, so we're starting to see new construction come on, which is great. Uh, we're starting to see uh, the values of homes start to increase naturally, not because of investors coming in and rushing and driving prices up. It's, it's what I would call a healthy increase in, in home values going up. Uh, and so as we continue to see that go, uh, go forward, we're, we're optimistic that that helps with these shortfalls. Uh, but, you know, that's only a, one slice of the pie, as you know, as far as the income coming in Maricopa County. Well, and, and again, uh, it, you can look at it two ways. It's like it, it's been a factor before, but it's getting better. How do you forecast that into future budgets? Well, we, we do so very carefully, very cautiously. I would tell you that a few years back before the new board uh, came into uh, existence, they were almost overly cautious, where uh, you would call that padding one's budget. 
uh, we're, we're more focused, I think, now than we were historically by way of putting a sensible budget that's, that's meeting, that's practical. And we're seeing an increase in sales tax revenues, which is very encouraging, and vehicle license tax revenues as does, well. Does that mean that these, these zero-based budgets, and talk to us a little bit about that, sure. because I know this is relatively new there at the county, it submitting zero-based budgets, will that continue once tax revenues and property tax revenues, the whole nine yards, once they get back on track? Look, we're, we are shifting the whole mindset in Maricopa County. And we're shifting it uh, to a business mindset where you have uh, zero-based budgeting, where you have, and, and let, me, let me give you a great example. We had several departments, more than 50% of the departments asking for an increase in year-over-year -year budgets. By the time we went and sat with them and said, look, here are the vacancy savings, here are the other savings you can capture within your budget to meet your needs without getting an increase, I'm pleased to tell you a fraction of those at the end of the day, ended up getting an increase. So we're, we're sitting down, which, which never happened before, not until last year, my colleague Denny Barney. It wasn't until then that actually a chairman of the Board of Supervisors went and sat with all the electeds and went over their budget. So not only is it zero-based, we're bringing in a new mindset that's, pragmati that, that's pragmatic, that's, that's saying, look, we've got to do something here, we've got to do it differently, and we have to roll up our sleeves and stop just increasing budgets for the sake of increasing budgets. And yet the only departments that apparently did get increases, criminal justice, public safety, and over half of this budget is devoted to those areas. Why? That, and that's, that goes back to something we spoke about earlier. Uh, my, my emphasis has always been it's about needs, not wants. We have all these capital projects that, that are definitely necessary, but they're not necessary today. You know, it's like driving your car to 100,000 miles, right? And, and so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to maximize the best we can all of our capital. And then as we need to expend dollars for new improvements, we will. But 52% of our budget is to public safety, which is important. And that's something you can't chintz on. Uh, and so that's where we put our money because we had to do it. We had no other choice. Other costs that could wait. We're putting to the side, we're waiting. How much of the budget has to be uh, spent on the Melendres case regarding uh, the Sheriff's Department, that ongoing uh, case, and just the penalties involved, the costs involved? I mean, we're reading anything from a $50 million total right. and then some. What's going on there? Well, it's, it's unfortunate in, in many ways, and, and I don't think anyone wants to in any way celebrate what's happened here. Of course, uh, it's not what we'd like to see happen, but you're looking at beyond $17 million uh, this year alone and what we'll end up uh, doing to uh, comply with uh, Judge Snow's ruling. And I think it's important that you and your, and your viewers know that Maricopa County is, is positioned and will follow Judge Snow's order. Uh, we will be in compliance. We want to work with our deputies. We want to work with the sheriff's office to make sure that we're carrying out these duties. I'm, I'm pleased to tell you that year over year in the past two years, lawsuits have, against Maricopa County have come down 10 percent. So on one track, we're making great progress. On the Melendres track, the idea is we continue to make progress there so those, those dollars spent will come down over time as compliance continues to, to go onward. All right, last question before you go. Uh, this budget, um, the money involved, impact on delivering county services. Will there be much of an impact, if any? No, I think the good news here is we're, we're looking at environmental services, you know, the mosquito issues we have during the summer. We're looking at uh, making sure we have enough deputies on the streets and the sheriff's offices and the resources we have uh, to be what we should be as the fourth largest county in the nation. So no, I expect things to only be better in that regard, not less. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you we for having me. It. Thank you.
National Assessment of Educational Progress recently announced its 2014 report card and it shows no improvement in the low proficiency of the nation's eighth graders in the subjects of history, geography and civics. Here now is Frank Riggs, president and CEO of the Joe Foss Institute, which works to improve civics education. Good to see you again. Thanks for Thank joining you, Ted. us. Thank you, Ted. Appreciate the opportunity. Okay, eighth graders, we're talking geography, civics, history, they're not making progress. What's going on? No noticeable improvement over the last NAEP results four years ago in, in 2010. And frankly, we're, we're just, uh, we're flatlined in civics education in our country. And it's very discouraging because the fundamental purpose of public education is to prepare young people for citizenship. So when the tests came out four years ago and everyone raised a ruckus, what happened to the ruckus? What, 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 no, something's not working here. No, it's not. And in fact, you know, the, the NAEP, uh, the civics portion, or civics, geography, and history portion, used to be administered at the fourth and twelfth grade levels as well. That's been eliminated. Now it's given just in the eighth grade. And there hasn't been much of a hue and cry. And it's unfortunate because civics education is really t taking a backseat role in our K-12 schools. And as I said, the founding purpose, the original purpose of public education, was to teach democracy and prepare young people for responsible citizenship. Uh, history, under-proficient, uh, but better than 1994. When we talk about history, what kind of history is being assessed here? Fundamental American history. That's why our organization, the Joe Foss Institute, is promoting the Civics Education Initiative, uh, asking each state to enact legislation across the country to, so it becomes the law of the land, requiring high school seniors to pass the U.S. citizenship test as a, a condition of graduation and in order to receive their diploma. And we're, we can proudly, as Arizonans, take credit for the fact that we were the first state in the nation to pass that legislation and we're showing the way. You know, my high school years were the dim and distant past, but I remember <laughs> we all had to take civics. You had, there was no choice. I don't know right. if it was a requirement for graduation, but you had to run through that class to get out of there. It is the only uh, uh, subject-specific instruction mandate in Arizona law. The, did you know that? No. The teaching of civics is required by Arizona statute in, for one year in the common schools, which today we would identify as our middle or junior high schools, and one year in high school. Yet civics education continues to, to, to sort of have second class citizenship status or you know, st stepchild status uh, in our schools. And, that, and that's a real shame. And you know, there's a number of reasons for that. One is the increased emphasis on the core academic subjects, all of the testing that is aligned mm -hmm. to the core academic subjects, mm -hmm. the reduction of resources for K-12 education, resulting in a shorter school day, shorter school year, something's got to give. But we want to see the, the, the focus on civics education restored in our school, and we want to breathe life back in the, into the civic mission of our schools. We talked about history, we talked about civics, geography, that's absolutely flat as well. I mean, what, so no one can find Kansas on the map anymore? <laughs> well, geography, history, and civics, all flatlined, as I said earlier, no improvement over four years ago, and it really ought to be a wake-up call for us as a, as a country. I mean, we, we frankly, are in, in, at real risk of losing our identity as a people and a nation. Uh, of course, through the teaching and learning of history and civics, we learn about our basic freedoms and rights as American citizens. The one thing that we all have in common, the one thing that unites us as a people and as a country. As far as these students, are there, is there a difference in the lower and higher performing students? Are the higher performing students also flatlining? That, or is that is a great question because, you know, it's not a question of peaks and valleys. There's been really no uptick. We haven't seen the, you know, the above average proficiency or the excelling mm -hmm. test scores in the NAEP increase. So it, as a whole, I think, again, it's just a direct result of the fact that we've been emphasizing this, uh, you know, this standardized uh, curriculum, teaching to the test, a lot of focus on the core academic subject, promoting the hard sciences, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math, over the soft sciences, which include social studies, broadly uh, defined as history, geography, and civics. Mm -hmm. And we, we really have to come back around to the realization that as taxpayers, and certainly parents of school-aid children, as consumers of public education, that we need to insist that the proper role of our public schools, our taxpayer-funded schools, is to prepare young people for college, career, and citizenship. Well, all right, Frank, it's good to see you. Let's hope in four years we don't ask you back and say, what's going on out there? Let's <laughs> well, hopefully... if we have anything to say about it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to increase. It's, we're going to improve. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure.
This is Asian Pacific American History Month. A good time to note that Arizona's Asian population growth rate ranks number two in the nation. Ted Namba is president of the Asian Chamber of Commerce here in Phoenix. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Thank you, Ted. Uh, number two in the country we are. How do you explain that? You know, the entire Southwest is hot right now. Um, as you probably heard, 46% growth rate uh, from census 2000 to 2010 in the Asian Pacific American community. So tremendous growth throughout the country, uh, especially in California, uh, Nevada and uh, Arizona. Did you think that Nevada and Arizona, because I know Nevada is up there too in the top five, mm -hmm. uh, is it because of our proximity to California? I believe so. Mm -hmm. uh, certain states, uh, you know, uh, when the immigrants first came to the United States, California, the West Coast was the most popular in the beginning. But slowly, uh, I'm not sure if it's the economy, people like myself shifted from LA to the uh, Phoenix area due to you know, great housing rates here. Mm -hmm. So there's been a huge influx from uh, California. Age levels, what are we talking about here? Skewing mostly younger, middle, older? What do we see in the Asian community? Well, I think uh, census 2010 showed that uh, the average age of Asian Pacific Americans was 36 uh, in 2010. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's biased though. You know, there's a lot of aging of the older generation, but there, there are some new children uh, adding into the mix. As far as education levels, as far as voting numbers, those sorts of things, again, what are we seeing? Tremendous growth. Um, if you compare the Asian Pacific American community in terms of education, 50% of Asian Americans uh, that are 25 and above have a bachelor's degree uh, compared to the average of about 30 percent. Uh, in terms of voting, um, maybe our voting rate in 2012 election was about uh, 47 percent, so about average. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did notice though in the census report that th there seems to be a difference between Asians and Pacific Islanders in mm -hmm. terms of education, jobs, and these sorts of things. What's going on there? It's a good point, uh, Ted. Uh, th there is a difference. Uh, I think back in 97, uh, they determined that they would separate Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And, uh, you know, there's this myth of the model minority that uh, many people think that just because you're Asian American, you've attended graduate school and have a great job, uh, you have health insurance, you have all these benefits. But in reality, there's a large influx of Pacific Islanders that are immigrants and they're still getting established and socioeconomically they're struggling at this point in time, many of them. So is that, is that the reason because they're relatively new? Uh, maybe the history isn't quite there with Pacific Islanders as it is with other Asian Americans? I believe so. You know, some groups like the Chinese and Japanese have been here for over 100 years, mm -hmm. whereas uh, people from uh, the Micronesia, Chamorro, uh, they've been here maybe in the last decade. As far as the valley is concerned, areas of concentration in the valley. I know there, there, there are parts of the East Valley uh, where the Mekong Plaza is, mm -hmm, down at mm -hmm. Lili's down there in Chandler. Mm -hmm. It seems like there are areas where there are heavy concentrations. Am I getting that right? I believe you're right, yeah. Warner and Dobson, where Lili's market at, huge, um, within a mile radius of there, tremendous uh, number of uh, Asian Americans. Uh, I live in the Northwest Valley in Glendale. There used to be a very large Japanese American community, but since then everybody's kind of uh, spread out through, throughout the entire valley. Do you see that though, again, as, as this group, the, the longer you're here, the more you don't maybe hang out to get you start spreading out, you start moving to different areas. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, my group, the Japanese American community, probably has the highest um, um, out marriage rate of any group. Well, I think uh, studies show that 75% of Japanese Americans marry outside the race. But I think you're right, our community's been around here for so long, for 100 years, that we're kind of more mainstream compared to immigrants that are new to the uh, United States. So we've talked about the challenges facing some of these, these newer immigrants of Pacific Islanders. As far as Asians in general, challenges out there, what needs to be worked on? What are you concerned about? Well, I think there's always challenges. Um, I'm very pro-immigration uh, reform. Uh, we have a lot of um, Filipino Americans who have family members still in the Philippines. Really sad, wait lists of 20 to 30 years. Uh, I think we should do our part to uh, developing a nice pathway to get these families reunified. Uh, I think in business, um, there's 1.5 million businesses, uh, Asian American businesses in the U.S. Uh, they bring in $506 million, billion dollars of economic output to the United States. But I think there's some businesses in the API community that are still struggling. Uh, last question, does something like an SB 1070, which let's face it, was not focused on Asian Americans, but does something like that regarding immigration uh, put a little cold spell on folks thinking of moving here? I think so. Personally, I believe so, Ted. Um, as Asian Chamber President, uh, we took a strong position. Uh, we, we filed as a plaintiff against SB 1070. 
uh, I think that we need to make Arizona more business friendly. And I think some of the uh, things that have happened the past half dozen years haven't helped, but hopefully going forward, we'll have a new team going forward that'll be more business friendly for the, uh, everybody here in Arizona. All right, Ted Namba, Asian Chamber of Commerce. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. Arizona's first Hispanic governor was honored at a memorial service over the weekend. More than 100 people fill the old Capitol Rotunda to celebrate the life of Raul Castro, who passed away last month. Like most Arizonans, I'll remember him best as our history-making 14th governor. Governor Castro epitomized the triumph of the human spirit and the hope of the American dream. He was born into humble beginnings. Social and racial discrimination were daily obstacles. But he refused to remain oppressed. Raul could be considered one of the first dreamers, a child brought to this country with no documentation whatsoever but with plenty of ambition and intelligence. And seeing the advantages offered by the country, he seized the chance to be part of it. And did he ever succeed? You know, Governor Castro, of course, didn't just uh, plop down in the world and become our governor. Uh, he worked his way up the ladder. Uh, he uh, originally uh, ran for Pima County attorney uh, in the early 1950s, in 1954 specifically. Uh, as, as he put it, uh, it was an extraordinary year for him, a great year for him, uh, because he was elect elected the first Hispanic Pima County attorney. Um, and at the time, uh, his wife also reminded him that was the year we got married, uh, so you should make a note of that as well. I will never forget the lesson that he taught me regardless of a person's state in life, that that person deserves respect. He wanted to make sure that his administration would be accessible to any person that needed to have advice or had a problem or was able to find some recommendation from a governor. In fact, I remember one time he had an open house to the public and uh, chaotic, but he had it. <laughs> Some of my favorite times with my grandfather were during the annual Sun Devils versus Wildcat Thanksgiving football games. My alma mater was Arizona State University, and of course one of his alma maters was our biggest rival, the other university. <laughs> Over the course of his rich and wondrous 98 years on earth, he was known as a man who was guided by the belief that if you worked hard, lived a principled and dignified life, and if you always treated people with respect, that you could succeed. But more importantly, that you would earn the respect of others. He may be gone, but we are more because of him. He bridged countries, languages, years, jobs, and hearts. He was the border and the center both. We have lost this man, but not what he has given. We have no way to say thank you except to live our lives with him still in it to thank him by doing what he too would have done. The service also included letters from Presidents Barack Obama and from Jimmy Carter, who appointed Castro as U.S. Ambassador to Argentina. It was one of Castro's three Latin American ambassadorships. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, it's another look at science news with ASU physicist Lawrence Krauss. And we'll hear from an award-winning author about her latest book on illegal immigration. That's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon.
That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.